Good afternoon and a warm welcome to all to the virtual side event at the High Level Political Forum 2020 titled Delivering Results for Not Leaving Indigenous Peoples Behind COVID-19 Responses and Beyond. My name is Lola Garcia Lix and I am the Senior Advisor on Global Governance in the International Workgroup for Indigenous Affairs, IFKIA. But before we start, I want to give the floor to my colleague, uh, David, uh, uh, to explain some of the technicalities regarding the simultaneous interpretation that is available uh, during the event. So please, uh, David, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lola. And thank you everyone for joining us. We're very happy to see so many attendees coming in. Um, as a technicality, interpretation is, is provided in the Zoom call in both English to Spanish and Spanish to English. And in order to access this, you need to be using either the desktop application or the mobile app on your phone. And um, to do so, then you will look in the main Zoom client and on the bottom uh, bar where you see participants, question and answer, uh, chat, then you'll also see a globe that says interpretation. By clicking on this globe, you'll then see a list of both of our languages, the English channel and the Spanish channel. And when you select the language that you want to hear, so if you'd like to hear the English uh, presenters in Spanish, you'll select Spanish. Then please also unmute the original audio or else you will hear both audio on top of each other. Le den a so if you only want to hear Spanish, then you'll only select Spanish eh, el and then you'll select Unmute Original Audio. Sala para que esa unmute forma original audio. Sonido ambiente and the same if you are listening to the Spanish and you want to hear the Gracias. English, then you will select the English channel. If there are any questions, please ask in the chat and we'll be happy to answer as we can. Perhaps we should mention, David, that uh, there is the possibility of uh, making uh, questions to, to the panelists uh, and using the questions and answer uh, icon or function of the Zoom. Exactly. And uh, please, if you use it, write the name or if you want to address the question to a specific panelist, uh, please uh, write it in the, in the questions and answers function. But thank you very much, uh, David. Um, I think I want to start saying that this is a, a joint initiative and therefore I would like to take the opportunity to thank the co-organizers of this side event, which are the Indigenous Peoples Major Group on Sustainable Development, the Indigenous Peoples and Development Unit of UNDESA and the Asian Indigenous Peoples Pact. Thank you very much to all of you for making this event possible. And of course, I want to extend our deepest gratitude to all speakers for joining us for this event. I know that you are all very busy and there are many other events. So I really appreciate that you take the time to join us today. I will say that the intention of the organizers is that this side event organized on the margins of the high level political forum provides a virtual space to voice indigenous people's views on how to ensure that their rights are respected and protected in responses given by the international community and states to the current COVID-19 pandemic. But also we would like to reflect on the role of the SDG framework in a post-pandemic world where economic recovery will be the main priority for all states. In this context, the international community must ensure that indigenous people's rights are fully respected and protected and that the economic recovery of states respects indigenous people's right to land and to their self-determined development. In a post-pandemic world and in the context of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, governments worldwide should support indigenous peoples to implement their own plans to protect their communities and participate in the elaboration of nationwide initiatives to ensure that these do not discriminate against them and they are not 
again or continue being left behind. In the context of this discussion, it was also our interest to explore the potential of the recommendations made by international and regional mechanisms dealing with indigenous people's rights. And for this, we, we had hoped to count with uh, the chairperson of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, but unfortunately, unfortunately she's not uh, uh, She's not able to join us and with Francisco Cali, the special rapporteur, the UN special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples, which he's not uh, available either. But uh, we have with us uh, Antonia Urrejola, which is the uh, vice president of the Inter-American Commission and the, and the rapporteur on indigenous peoples rights of the Inter-American Commission. But I will introduce the panelists later on, but thank you very much to all of you for for joining us and for using your time uh, for this side event. So with these uh, few words, I would like to introduce, and I have the honor to introduce Martin Bille Hermann, which is the ambassador and permanent representative of Denmark to the UN for some opening remarks. Please, Martin, the floor is yours. No, uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Lola and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening uh, to everybody who is uh, sort of joining uh, joining this virtual event uh, around the globe. Fantastic to see the participants uh, this, this is uh, increasing. Uh, and for many reasons, uh, this is a very, very, uh, very, very uh, important uh, topic. I want to begin by thanking, uh, of course, Evgia, uh, you, Lola, but also uh, David and, 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 and other colleagues, but also the Indigenous Peoples uh, Major Group for Sustainable uh, Development, John, who is also uh, with us today, uh, the, the UN Indigenous Peoples uh, Unit in DESA, and then, of course, uh, Asia Indigenous uh, Peoples uh, Pact for, for, uh, for organizing uh, this and, and, and giving us a, a platform to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how the Kingdom of Denmark uh, views uh, this. Uh, now, it will come as no surprise to you that uh, Indigenous Peoples issues is and has been for a long time and continues to be one of the Kingdom of Denmark's uh, core human rights uh, priorities. Uh, we remain an ally uh, working uh, for the recognition and the realization uh, of Indigenous Peoples' rights and, 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 and a strong advocate for what is a basic fact that to actually to achieve uh, Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable uh, de uh, Development Goals, uh, we must take action to ensure that no one is, is left behind. Uh, and only then will we have uh, succeeded. And taking action on, uh, on indigenous people's issues is, is long uh, overdue. Now, if anything, uh, COVID-19 and the global pandemic has shown this uh, to, to, to be the case. Now, it has revealed uh, underlying uh, structural uh, inequalities, uh, systematic uh, uh, exclusions, uh, uh, and, and, and shown us uh, what has been true for a long uh, time. It has unmasked, as I said, uh, sort of these structural inequalities uh, and, and the marginalization uh, that indigenous peoples uh, suffer, suffer under. And sadly, it's a reality that has only not only been unmasked or laid bare by the pandemic, but actually also exacerbated uh, by the uh, by the pandemic. And and to help actually put focus on the lack of adequate social uh, services in the indigenous uh, communities and the disproportionate health and and socioeconomic risks that uh, that indigenous peoples are facing, Denmark recently, as part of the group of friends of indigenous peoples in in New York, put out a joint call. Uh, to protect the health, well-being, and livelihoods of indigenous peoples in the response and recovery efforts that are being planned or underway uh, uh, across the world. Now, we're also seeing how you might say that how the pandemic and, well, to some extent, how the, the crisis has, has, in inverted commas, legitimized initiatives beyond the, beyond the usual. And indigenous peoples who were already before the crisis, uh, at particularly high risk of being subjected to reprisals, are experiencing targeting uh, and restrictions of their uh, of their freedoms. Now, indigenous right defenses are, are especially at risk, and there is, in, in our view, an urgent need to support them. Now, on on Friday morning, Denmark, uh, together with Civicus, 
uh, UN Foundation and others will host a side event actually dedicated to discussing how to protect uh, civic space, including for indigenous peoples in the context of COVID-19. Now, I want to say that, that the adoption um, on the rights of indigenous peoples by the General Assembly back in 2017 was, of course, a, a key and an important milestone to advance the rights and, and aspirations of, of indigenous uh, peoples. But it's also clear that continued human rights violations against indigenous peoples illustrates the real gap in the realizations of the rights and well-being of indigenous people, which is imperative. And we need to close this gap because if not, we will not uh, achieve uh, the SDGs and we will be leaving uh, people uh, behind. Now, I want to say a little bit about uh, sort of the, the report, uh, the thematic report uh, for the HLPF uh, this year, because I think there were some issues that I think was quite striking. Now, I think it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, uh, UNEP, the UN's Environment Program came out uh, with, with a report that undersc underscored the close link between COVID-19 and, and the health crisis that we are facing, and as a result of the health crisis, the socioeconomic crisis we're facing, and the close links this has with our relationship with nature, with, uh, with Mother Earth, as it was. Um, and that we need to have you know, a much stronger understanding of the interconnectedness between humanity uh, and, and, uh, and the natural environment and the planet. And what was striking uh, to me, reading a summary of the thematic uh, report for the HLPF uh, this year, prepared by UGIA and the Indigenous Peoples uh, Major Group for Sustainable Development, was that Indigenous people, while constituting around 6%, of the global population are to some extent guardian of or occupy or inhabit uh, a quarter of the world's surface, but protect 80% of the planet's remaining biodiversity. Now, in other words, and I suppose that is the simple uh, fact and one we need to work together to get across is that indigenous peoples are not only the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, but also stewards of most of our remaining biodiversity. And it goes without saying that indigenous peoples have important contributions, important insights and understanding and contributions to make to adaptation and, and mitigation effort. And as we look towards a, a sustainable and just future uh, on the other side of, of the pandemic, as we look towards building back better and, and, and greener, as we would say in the Nordic uh, countries, I think it is extremely important that we also look towards the meaningful inclusion of indigenous peoples. Standing uh, for biodiversity cons uh, conservation and climate change adaptation in, in our green uh, recovery. So I think this year's HLPF is, a, is an opportunity, even though the circumstances are unusual, to try and get that message across. That this is about, of course, leaving no one behind. But it is actually also about, you know, taking us forward. Tema de llevarnos adelante a todos de forma mucho más fuerte with nature and the planet uh, that we uh, that we inhabit. So, Lola, I'm sorry I took uh, way too long, but I had a lot uh, I thought I wanted to say, and then I want to end by apologizing that I won't be able to stay with you for the entire duration of this important side event. You're absolutely right. There is a flurry of side events uh, going on, but uh, it was a priority for me to be here, and I have a colleague that will stay with you. Uh, throughout. But uh, once again, thank you so much for giving me the floor. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you very much for, for pointing out some key issues. Uh, of course, the, the issue of the implementation gap, the issue of the, you have the UN declaration, you have uh, a lot of good results and, uh, and key decisions taken by, by, by the UN, but um, we are far away from implementation and this uh, gap is, uh, is widening. But also for remarking the, the contribution of indigenous peoples, we will hear more about that from our indigenous panelists, but I think it's very important to see the role and the contribution on indigenous peoples uh, 
in the post pandemic or what you said in the other side of the pandemic and this is a very important message and i'm happy that we count with denmark as an ally on all this thank you very much martin i will give uh, the floor to commissioner urrajola now and uh, antonia is a lawyer from chile she is currently the Vice President of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples' Rights. I know, Antonia, we have been in touch. Uh, you have had uh, communications, constantly communications with Indigenous peoples in the region regarding uh, their situation and their responses regarding to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, Antonia, I... I, I I would like you to share with us the responses that the Inter-American Commission has been given and how do you see the responses also and the actions in the future. Please, Antonia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lola. Um, hello to everyone. I'm going to speak in Spanish though. It just, it's a bit easier for me, but hello to everyone that's listening today. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. En primer lugar, quiero dar las gracias First of all, I would like to thank you for this invitation, for this invite. I think that as a commissioner of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, it's very important that we are nearer to the indigenous organizations from different parts of the world. And I think we should also be nearer to other mechanisms of the UN that deal with protection of indigenous rights. So that's why I think that this uh, high level forum is very important and it's very important and this is why I want to participate. I will tell you what was had been going on for the last uh, month, years in the commission. So we monitor the situation regarding human rights in the region. And since the pandemic arrived in the continent, we have been monitoring um, and very worried because we have been monitoring, monitoring the situation of the most vulnerable indigenous peoples, as well as other peoples. Through our mechanisms, we have been informed of the different obstacles handles, and the different impacts that the indigenous peoples have had to face in the continent. Among others, we can mention uh, difficult access to health services. Hospitals are very far away in general from indigenous peoples areas, and sometimes they have to travel even for a day. They cannot receive medical treatment. We know that they don't have the basic means that they need to survive. Many times they cannot even be tested on COVID-19, which is very important because then measures cannot be taken about this. And we also know that the urban centers that are near the nearest to the indigenous people's territory in general do not have enough beds for all patients. So, we already know what the situation is uh, with the indigenous peoples and that they do not have a lot of medical services nearby, but now the situation has exa been exacerbated because of this pandemic. We also know that the um, cultural knowledge about indigenous peoples is not very uh, widespread and this makes it even more difficult for them to receive the treatment that they need. We are also very worried about the food security of the indigenous people in the continent because this exacerbates the, um, the problems created by the pandemic and presents a real threat to their existence of the indigenous peoples. We have been talking to states because we're very concerned about this. We are also very worried and we have always been worried due to the presence of external actors in indigenous territories. And here I'm not only talking about security forces, which is also a problem because they bring contagion, but we are also talking about the mining industry, timber industry, there are uh, drug dealers. We see coke, for example, there and drug trafficking in indigenous territories in general is a very serious problem. We know that this problem has been there for many years and that it's a threat for their existence. 
and we have also seen murderers due to the situation in indigenous territories. But now the risk is even higher because these people also bring COVID to these uh, to these peoples. We have seen that these industries, these um, these external actors keep um, going into the indigenous territory now more than ever. So there is more contagion. And this is why they put at risk the health of not only the indigenous peoples and their individuals, but as, uh, as a collective group as well. We have always been worried uh, uh, of the Pan Amazon um, area and the situation of the indigenous peoples there. For example, the ones who are there in self-isolation, voluntary self-isolation. We used to be worried because of dengue and other uh, diseases to which they are exposed in these areas. And of course, uh, COVID-19 has a, a reason the alert even more. We also know that the self voluntary self-isolated people in Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Brazil, Venezuela are being attacked more than ever. And unfortunately, I cannot really name and describe all the situations that we are seeing there, but I would like to put an emphasis on how worried we are about these people. A few days ago, we know that there were three Yanomari mothers who found the bodies, the dead bodies of their babies. They were supposed to have pneumonia. They were taken out of there to treat them and supposedly they died of COVID-19. The mothers don't know what happened to them and uh, they have not received the corpses yet. And the reason why I want to say this is because not only are they sad because they have lost their children, but also I want to uh, put the emphasis on the, the impact of this. They have not been able to say goodbye to their children following their rituals. And so this does not only affect them, but the whole community because of the way in which they see death and the rituals around it. We have also said that they should have the right to mourn and to carry out their own rituals. This is fundamental for all of us, but it's in particular for indigenous peoples. We also know that consultations, uh, we are trying to carry out consultations related to the exploitation of indigenous territories. We know now that indigenous peoples want to have um, consultations carried out, oh, and we only come to know this due to social platforms, which is incredible. We think that virtual consultations are not only inadequate because the majority of indigenous territories do not have access to internet or have it very, a very difficult um, internet situation, but also the timing, the methodology, and the dialogue with indigenous people cannot be carried out in this way. And the, the, the process of making decisions cannot be taken this way. So we understand that um, these um, online consultations really go against the uh, rights. The Inter-American Commission adopted resolution 12020, which regards the pandemics and human rights during pandemic in the America. It contains more than 85 recommendations in the state in what is related to the pandemics and how the people in the continent are affected. And it contains specific recommendations to the, for the indigenous peoples. In May, the commission um, issued a press release where uh, we warned states of the vulnerability of the indigenous people in the context of the pandemic. And we recommended the states to um, fulfill their obligations with the indigenous peoples and to respect the cultural diversity. Broadly speaking, we have issued a series of recommendations related to human rights in, uh, in these pandemic times. One of these recommendations is related to the importance of giving indigenous peoples information about the pandemic in their, uh, 
their native language because that uh, bridges the cultural gap and al would allow them to understand as best as possible how to um, use this pandemic and what they should do. In many of the isolated territories, the people don't know what the effects of this pandem pandemia are. Secondly, we remind the states that they have the uh, obligation with indigenous peoples to guarantee health services and that there should be a focus on gender and intergenerational um, medicine. We, the also traditional knowledge should be taken into account as well as medis, medical traditional knowledge. The state should, should respect their knowledge but should also seize their knowledge. And this is fundamental because they know a lot about health. Thirdly, we have recommended that the states guarantee the participation of indigenous peoples through their representatives when implementing and deciding public policies, both regarding prevention and uh, medical treatment for the population. I'm not going to uh, mention all the recommendations, but there is one that's very important and that I talked about before regarding virtual consultations. We recommend the States of the Americas to avoid fostering legislative initiatives or to authorize exploitation actions uh, near or in territory, um, indigenous territories because there, ha there are social distances measure, distancing measures so they cannot really go near the indigenous people and therefore they cannot really provide an informed consent. Virtual consultations only make the situation worse. We have also recommended that states uh, reinforce the, self -iso the isolation and social distancing measures uh, for indigenous peoples, always respecting their right to self-determination and respecting the principle of non not going near to the people, uh, just peoples who are in self-isolation. This is fundamental to protect their life as a population. And here we have insisted in the need of having the states respect all these principles. We have also highlighted this the importance of having statistics that are not aggregated. We have seen information about contagion in different countries, but very few countries have given information and statistics related to indigenous peoples, gender and age. It is fundamental to have non-aggregated, disaggregated information to be able to encourage public policies to guarantee uh, medical treatment and health services for the indigenous people. And we have to incorporate the criterion of self-identification when we talk about statistics. This is also key and the states have not done enough in this regard. Talking about COVID-19, we, the Commission, has maintained virtual dialogues with representatives of the indigenous people without any intermediaries or third party. We have talked to the indigenous peoples directly to see what are the challenges that they are facing in terms of human rights in the region. One of the most important initiatives that we have had is to facilitate dialogue between uh, indigenous peoples in the Pan-Amazon region so that they can develop strategies and protect their peoples during COVID-19, the COVID-19 pan pandemic. I would like to say that here the indigenous peoples using their own autonomy have adopted protection and prevention measures uh, before the, the virus and they should serve as an example for other people. And, how, and I would also like to highlight how important it is for indigenous people to be able to make decisions on their own. The Commission has also expressed uh, its concern regarding what would happen post pandemia and how this situation will affect indigenous peoples. On the one hand, there will be an uh, financial impact which worries us. We have seen that governments have announced supporting measures for the population but in general they do not reach the indigenous peoples so these are structural factors 
that we are very worried about because we, they will contribute to the well-known uh, discrimination and exclusion of indigenous people. And they will, these patterns will not only uh, be reproduced, but they will also uh, deepen, exacerbate. We know uh, and we're afraid that um, post in the post-pandemic scenario, the, um, this, uh, the economic situation of indigenous people will be very, um, will be, um, there will be a deficit in this uh, sense. We are worried about then the post-pandemic situation, and we think that the governments and the uh, international cooperation organizations should pay attention to the indigenous peoples, which has not really happened now. There used to be a lack of um, health services, and now it has been exacerbated due to a uh, collapse of the health services of the countries in general. So we are very worried about the indigenous people situation in this sense. We have recommended that the indigenous people participate when formulating and implementing public policies to give medical treatment and that a focus is um, placed on gender and intercultural um, topics. And this is not only important today, but also in the post-pandemic scenario. The indigenous peoples have been trying to reinforce their mechanism regarding food security and health issues, and they should be uh, supported by the Commission and international community. The measures taken by the um, states of the region should not um, go over the indigenous people's right to have their the control over their territories and the prior free and informed consent regarding everything that has to do with their human rights. And I think that not only the states should be the ones um, taking the lead here, we should also, uh, we should not only talk about the economy, but also about the pri pre, uh, free prior and informed consent. We should also take into account the role of multilateral, multilateral organism, for example, with the International Development Bank. I think that uh, when talking about economic reactivation, these organizations should also respect the inter-American standards, respect indigenous peoples and their free prior and informed concern. The indigenous peoples have exhorted the international community and the government to um, maintain dialogue and to um, be able to talk about financial issues, health issues, and what will happen after the pandemic. They have all gathered through the COICA to um, an organization to um, get a dialogue with the government. And it, should, it is key that in the post-pandemic situation, the states consult and cooperate with indigenous peoples. The, the different impact that the COVID-19 will have on the indigenous peoples group should be taken into account because it's not the same as for the rest of the population and international and regional mechanisms uh, like our commission and universal mechanisms just uh, like the international forum uh, the un forum for indigenous peoples or other forums should also act in a coordinated way to defend and preserve indigenous people's rights. We see many continents, but uh, and we have different indigenous peoples in every continent, but I think we should all keep a coordinated response. Thank you very much, Lola. Thank you very much, Antonia, for this. I think it's very important to have a coordinated approach. And we all know that the multilateral organizations uh, should also step up to their role in the post-pandemic scenario, not only them, but also financial institutions, etc. And that this is very important. Thank you so much, Antonia, for this. I would now like to give the floor to Joan Carling. Joan Carling is an indigenous rights activist from the Cordillera region yes. in the Philippines. She has been working on indigenous issues at the grassroots and at the international level for more than 25 years. 
uh, from 2014 to 2016, uh, Joan was uh, an indigenous expert member from the Asia region at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Currently, uh, as a member of the Tsepteba Foundation, she's the co-convener of the Indigenous People's Major Group on Sustainable Development. Uh, Joanne, I would like if you could give us an overview on Indigenous Peoples, the Sustainable Development Goals and the COVID-19. Thank you, Joanne. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Lola. So I'll, I'll go straight to the, the overview uh, paper, so to, to save on time. But uh, let me first uh, begin with uh, presenting the recent data on indigenous peoples uh, globally coming from the International Labor Organization. Uh, so uh, before we are saying that indigenous peoples are 5% of the global population, but now when there's a, a recent survey done on the population, we are actually 6.2% of the global population uh, with an estimated uh, 476.6 million. And 70% uh, of this is in, in the Asia Pacific, also because it's the uh, concentration of the, of the big population of the world and then 16.3% in Africa, 11.5% uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, and 1.6% uh, in North America and 0.1% uh, for North America. Now, the other interesting uh, data that also came out is that globally, 73% of indigenous peoples still live in rural and remote areas meaning uh, that more than half of indigenous peoples are, are somehow still living in their territory or at least nearby its territory. Uh, however, within this is uh, in, in Latin America in particular, 52% live in urban areas. So there is already a demographic shift uh, of indigenous peoples in, in Latin America. But if we look at this data, nevertheless, in, in relation to COVID, uh, we know, as already cited, that both indigenous peoples in urban and rural areas are severely affected by COVID-19. Now, uh, if we look at the SDG implementation, we're looking at now wh where is indigenous peoples in the SDG implementation after four years. If, if we recall the, 2000, uh, the 2030 development, Sustainable Development Agenda took off in 2016. And uh, so we are now entering uh, what, uh, uh, in one third of the implementation period. But if we look at what have we achieved, what has the global uh, SDG achieved in relation to indigenous peoples? The, I, I just want to show some overall uh, observation and data in relation to this. One, what is clearly coming out uh, is that indigenous peoples are not only left behind in the SDG implementation, but are pushed behind further due to land grabbing, systemic uh, discrimination, continuing human rights violations, criminalization, and worsening inequality. Uh, and, and this is clearly shown in the disconnect between the compliance of states to their human rights obligations vis-a-vis -vis the economic targets that they are implementing in the SDG targets. Uh, if we look at the SDGs, for example, 90% of the targets are aligned to the realization of human rights, including the rights of indigenous peoples. However, the recommendations from human rights bodies relevant to the SDGs are not integrated in national development action plan, meaning uh, that development is again seen in separation with the need to respect and protect human rights as the very foundation of sustainable uh, development. So that's, uh, that's, we are still unfortunately in that situation. And then um, we are also, and, and this is still a continuing fight of indigenous peoples, is that we are continue uh, 
to be excluded and invisible in most SDG national actions, action plans and strategies. There are no reference to indigenous uh, peoples and even more so, there is no data disaggregation by ethnicity. I mean, Latin America uh, is, and the uh, Caribbean is the more advanced uh, compared to other, uh, other regions in terms of uh, data disaggregation by ethnicity. But un unless data disaggregation by ethnicity is done, we will not know the level of progress or gaps in the implementation of, 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 of the SDGs as it relates to indigenous uh, peoples. What is also clearly coming out from the SDG implementation is that there has hardly been any meaningful participation of indigenous peoples in SDG planning at local and national levels where it matters. There are participation at regional and global levels, but it is a very limited participation and the impact of SDGs are actually on the ground. So participation will have to be ensured at the local and national levels, but this is not happening in many of the, of the uh, countries with indigenous peoples. Now, uh, also the, the roles and contributions of indigenous peoples uh, under a holistic approach to sustainable development continues to be not recognized, protected, and, and, and supported. So we are still treated as vulnerable groups, uh, uh, marginalized groups, and, and our actual contribution as development actors, as rights holders, and as, as I mentioned earlier, as stewards of the natural uh, resources and, and the environment is, is still not uh, fully uh, recognized. Uh, so with that, uh, some of the, if we look at partic the particular goals, I will not go through it except for clear uh, tar uh, goals that are uh, very much also linked to the COVID-19. Is uh, under goal one with the objective of no poverty, we still continue to, to remain as 15% of the extreme poor of the global population, in spite of that, we are only 6.2%, meaning uh, we are already um, uh, very vulnerable uh, to COVID-19. Then uh, zero hunger uh, is that, again, uh, there's uh, data showing in of increase of, uh, of hunger due to land grabs, climate change, and also on the measures uh, on in related to COVID-19, particularly the lockdowns and restrictions because uh, indigenous peoples are, are there in many uh, 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 areas are not able to uh, have livelihoods and, and making their families go, go uh, hungry. If we look at goal three, on, and this is on health, good health and well-being. This is as already explained earlier, the lack of access to health and medical services uh, is disproportionately affecting indigenous peoples with higher incidence of infection and death uh, uh, in relation to COVID-19, but also the life expectancy of indigenous peoples is lower by 20 years. So we have already that condition and, and COVID-19 uh, still comes in, uh, into play. So, uh, and the, the goal six in terms of clean water and sanitation, uh, continuing lack of access in many countries of clean water and sanitation is again another factor of why COVID-19 is, is easily spreading in indigenous territories because they don't have this kind of, of facilities. So, so if we look at uh, the, the, the SDGs and, and where we are at the, in, in relation to COVID-19, it's very clear that uh, indigenous peoples are disproportionately affected. But what I, I want to also mention is that it's, uh, uh, it, it's not only the, that we are uh, getting the virus, but, but also the response measures of states are actually in violation of our collective rights in many cases. Or, uh, like is what's happening in Brazil, where uh, uh, illegal loggers or, or, or deforestation is, 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 uh, is worsening. So the, the, the land grabs are actually taking place under COVID-19. Uh, and on top of that are the criminalization also of, of uh, indigenous peoples when, uh, in, in defense of their lands and, and resources. We've seen in the case of Colombia, 
for example, that during the lockdown, two, uh, two uh, indigenous activists were shot because it's easy then for the paramilitary to locate these ac activists uh, during the, the, the lockdown. So that's just an example of how, unfortunately, the, the COVID-19 is even worsening the situation we find ourselves in. So finally, uh, just, just to uh, mention that we are also anti anticipating that, that due to the economic growth targets for the recovery period, there's more uh, uh, the chances of more land grabs and more human rights violations is going to take place if these uh, recovery measures will un be undertaken under business as usual approach and under the normal, which is the one of the problems. So uh, to end, I think for uh, many indigenous peoples, um, this is tantamount to an ex existential crisis which needs to be addressed with urgency and concerted actions with the inclusion of indigenous peoples in decision-making on the recovery plans. So uh, with this uh, overview, I believe the distinguished speakers will expound further on the implications of COVID-19 pandemic and with concrete proposals for the recovery period to avoid further violation of our rights and that our voice uh, uh, are heard and we are at the center of finding the solutions and actions to recover from COVID-19 and pursue sustainable development under the pledge of leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I think for your substantive overview, both from the very beginning on how many indigenous peoples are, the SDGs, the relevance of the different SDGs uh, for indigenous peoples, the lack of participation at the local level, the lack of, uh, of um, substantive uh, contribution of indigenous peoples in the, in the national action plans, so, and of course the, the issue of the COVID-19 and the, and the pro prospectives on the future possibly more land grabbing, more violence against indigenous peoples. But we will hear from the, from the ground now. And uh, I'm pleased to give the floor to Gamshin Rai. Gamshin Rai is an aga from Northeast India. He's a dedicated human rights activist for almost 30 years, defending and promoting the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, Gam is the Secretary General of Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, which is the network of indigenous peoples organizations in Asia. Please, Gam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lola, and greetings to all the participants. Um, we work in 14 countries, so I will not be giving any uh, specific information but I would like to focus on some of the lessons that we can draw from so far from the SDGs as well as the COVID uh, experience. Um, as we know that it has been shared that uh, indigenous peoples constitute uh, about 15 to 19% 19 of the world's extreme poor. Even though we are just about 6.2% uh, of the world's population. And the recent report and SDG also shows that some of the key goals of the SDG are, are regressing. For example, inequality is rising and loss of biodiversity and forests also is increasing. Now, these are critical issues for indigenous peoples because this means that the situation is worsening for indigenous peoples. And governments keeps harping that uh, their commitment is based on nat national circumstances and national legislations. But this does not explain the regression in some of the uh, goals and experiences of the pandemic of uh, indigenous peoples. The experience of the pandemic has exposed the faulty system as well as the systemic barriers and of the lack of commitment made by uh, the governments uh, in Asian countries. Now, during this pandemic, uh, we have heard of brutal violations of human rights, cases of suicides in large numbers, starvation deaths, displacements and uh, rolling back of rights, etc., uh, among the indigenous communities. 
And also governments have failed in most cases to reach out to indigenous peoples on time. And that is also the reason why there were so many starvation deaths and so on. And the worst sufferers are migrant workers, persons with disabilities uh, and women because they needed much more attention and support from governments and other agencies. Now this means that indigenous peoples are one of the worst hit by the lockdowns and restrictions imposed by uh, governments. However, I, would, I should also say that several indigenous peoples were able to respond well in leveling the curve of the uh, pandemic, of course, in pockets in different countries. Now, indigenous communities were able to set up their own quarantine centers, measures of uh, self-isolation, and taking several positive measures, including providing food and aids in several areas and territories across uh, Asia. Uh, so this leads to the question about how is it that the communities have achieved such financial and political autonomy and empowerment in some of these areas? You know? Indigenous communities have managed to best resist the pandemic. Are those that have some degree of autonomy or are de facto exercising the customary governance? which allows them to manage their land territories and, uh, and resources. And this is one of the main reasons. Now, this includes even the communities that have secured their territorial uh, rights in the recent times. For example, in the uh, Kukdale district in Maharashtra, the communities are already generating uh, 1 million US dollars from non-timber forest products annually, uh, uh, even though they have just got the land rights about three years ago. Now, these are success stories, but success stories actually are even greater where we see that there is partnership between indigenous uh, uh, institutions, civil society organizations, health institutions, and govern government agencies uh, working hand in hand to together. Of course, these are in very few cases, but it's something to learn from. Like, for example, in Thailand, where communities, health workers, and community health uh, volunteers are working together, and in the Mokokchung district of uh, India. And in these places, we still see that there are, there are zero cases of uh, COVID-19, uh, so they have responded very well. Now, also, when we look at the success stories, uh, there are also other stories that's relevant to the uh, SDGs. And this can be seen from the Human Development Index from Indigenous Peoples areas, where Indigenous Peoples have greater rights. For example, in the field of education, several Indigenous Peoples are actually doing better than the dominant groups or are beginning to level up or catch up with the other uh, uh, groups uh, that have more privileges. And this can actually be seen across other uh, indices like on health or mortality rate and so on. So this is to say that where there are better rights and better governance, indigenous peoples are doing far better. Therefore, the lessons that we should learn from the pandemic and before the pandemic itself is that there are several evidences and pathways for transformative actions for achieving the SDG uh, with reference to indigenous peoples. But what is lacking is the demonstration of commitments made by governments and businesses and learning to trust the people and empowering the communities. Because communities embody the values that underpin sustainable lifestyle and sense of responsibilities in discharge, uh, discharging their duties just as the ambassador uh, at the opening remark also said that most of the biodiversities are still in the indigenous areas and this proves that they are not just living there but they are also the stewards of this biodiversity you know? so if we are to draw lessons from covid uh, covid scenario and move towards recognition and implementation of the rights of indigenous peoples and uh, respect for free prior uh, and informed consent and create dynamic partnership between businesses, agencies and governments and communities. I think that the next 10 years of the SDG will potentially witness uh, transformative changes that we have ne ne uh, not seen before. 
And I think this is what we should be looking towards, whether it's businesses or whether in terms of governance, I think the important thing is creating partnership and putting the trust on the communities and the people to be able to bring about this kind of uh, uh, transformative changes. And this is, I think, for me, the most important lessons that we can see so far from the SDG, as well as the experience of the uh, COVID-19 uh, in Asia. So I will uh, stop here for now. Thank you, uh, Lola. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gam, for sharing the lessons learned of the COVID scenario. And uh, of course, uh, very important, uh, the link that you mentioned between the recognition of rights, the recognition of self-governance and the resilience and the indigenous peoples being better equipped to confront this kind of crisis. And the partnership component, I think, is also a very important, very happy to hear about uh, some of the lessons learned on how to be better equipped to protect yourself through partnerships. Thank you very much, Gam. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Tarsila Rivera, going now to Peru. Tarsila Rivera is a Quechua activist from Ayacucho. She's one of the most recognized indigenous women activists in Peru and uh, in the region. And um, she has received a lot of prizes for her long life commitment to the struggle of indigenous people's rights and particularly to indigenous women's rights. Um, Tarsila was a member of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues for the period 2017 to 2019. And presently, she is the president of Chirapac, a center for indigenous cultures of Peru. And she is also the executive president of the International Forum of Indigenous Women called FIMI, which promotes the leadership and political participation of, of millions of indigenous women across the globe. Tassila, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. And um, I would like to hear from your perspective uh, something about the COVID-19, but also the SDG framework and indigenous women's rights. Thank you very much, Tassila. The floor is yours. Muchísimas gracias por esta gran oportunidad de compartir. Thank you very much for this opportunity of uh, share with you some aspects that this pandemic gives us, even if it's not, it hasn't left us. And uh, following the example of our brother and sister that preceded me, in the, we have now, as far as I know, 25% of indigenous people's population in, in the America, women 28 million, and this means that we are a quite important population of the world. And I would also like to mention that in the intervention of the ambassador and, uh, and what uh, Ms. Urrejola said is quite encouraging because of all mechanisms had all the same direction. The states with big ears hearing our recommendations, I think their complaints would be not so important. And now looking at the regional context and this panorama we see in many places with this frustration and this indignation, uh, I have to say that really the ODS continue to be a dream for indigenous peoples. And we have said it always that the states have a big challenge before them. And we as indigenous peoples in this pandemic, we also have to help also these challenges, these internal challenges and external uh, challenges. And I think it is important this, to use 
all the mechanisms that the modern world gives us in order to globalize also our aims and visions for, in a constructive way. I think we have to be every time more stronger and more united as peoples in order to be able to be heard, in order to be able to do that in the states of the, the politics of the states that have not included us and are not going to so easy to include us, have strong voices, clear voices and representative voices. In the case of the external ex uh, challenges, I think it's important what uh, we heard before from our brother. Uh, up to what point do we, our indigenous movement, our indigenous organizations, are constructing, are building up alliances with social movements that are fighting for justice and the rights of everybody. In this movement, we have a diversity of the social movement. And it is sectors that are in a, that are very often not are ref, that are not reflected in, in, the, in, the, in the official uh, politics. But we have also those allies that are strategic allies that should be more openly seen uh, because since they are important. Because we have to get out of this of this of this old-fashioned system where the indigenous people, you know, these people they want lands, they want this, they're against the, the the economic development. How? That's a question. How to achieve that those who are uh, how the external area is able to use the measurements of the human rights for everything and everybody? That is one of the challenges this pandemic gives us. And in this external world, we have also, of course, the corporations. We have also, we have to see up to what extent these uh, corporations that want to increase uh, economics take into account the standards of human rights and also the ethics in their business. And that is where we have to take into account also up to what point in the external, from the point of view, we have to act in order to change this depredator uh, activity from the point of food, uh, from the point of view of the, the economic development. Because as Sebastian said, we, if we don't learn one from the others, all, we all are going to disappear because we are just uh, strength fostering this consumism that doesn't, that is not uh, satisfied with anything, then we are going to depredate even the water and the air we need. And so this is very an important challenge. We have it also in the, in, the, in the case of the corporations. And that is what also already has been done, said. I don't know how do you call the sector, the agencies, the financial agencies like uh, World Bank, like the BDM in our region, the World, the money fund, all they have to take to, into account that our states in this con pandemic uh, context that they are not uh, they are not bargaining with our rights because all these compromises of paying this this debt is something that brings us to well to see who is going to 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 to, to be short in these rights those it's it's the people file it's the people that is uh, getting into depth and so that's something i i wanted to underline but i think it's very very important from another aspect i when for instance we see the challenge from the point of view of the states that would be a, a third scenario internal external but we have also a concrete scenario uh, with regards to the states the states, we have been examined and assessed in this pandemic and up to what point have they implemented uh, politics for the indigenous people, but also for, 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 the, for, the, for the main population, for the mainstream population of these countries, because we see that historically, of course, indigenous peoples and women, indigenous women, we have been always invisible 
and we have been uh, not been taken into account with regards to the implementation with access to health, access to education, access, well, just in order to say a couple of examples, information, and all this brings us to say that the states have need information, clear information, because there's this this X-rays, so to say, with all these sectors of indigenous peoples, in spite of all these economic resources, may it be uh, mining or, or uh, tourism, or whatever. All these, uh, all these, uh, all these resources did not get back to uh, the the place of origin. In this case, indigenous peoples especially in the case of, of health and, and uh, education. Then we have also pending agenda with the agenda with, with the states. The sustainable development goals, are a, the SDGs are an opportunity. We advanced with, with the action plan of Beijing and of Cairo. These were two international compromises that specifically states uh, were supposed to take into account. Also inequality, we, there have been many questions about the inequalities, about the gaps in all, in all senses in our regions, how we should act and follow. I don't know if it's perhaps, uh, it's, it's very, perhaps a bit quite idealistic to say to, to, to follow, to help the states, because they have to learn the lessons. They have to have, have to learn, have learned the lessons of the different scenarios of the of the different uh, health services, and public services that are not there, that are really not there for 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 for, for the indigenous peoples and even for the mainstream population. So all these needs, uh, this, all these force us to to change our point of view of of what's going to happen in the future. And uh, with regards to the gaps, we are in a region where on one side we have the legislative and executive power on one side and, and we have to learn this other lesson about how to articulate, how to get together and how to promote a dialogue in order to respond to what this pandemic leaves us. Because the problem is this one, where is the scenario where the different actors are bidding for having an inclusive state and where we're going, we're going to leave the extreme poverty. This is one of the most important challenges we have in our, in our, in our, in our uh, region. Corruption of uh, public charges and of power. So that all this brings us finally to scenario we have persecution for defending uh, other interests, uh, presence of other actors who instead of protecting security and, and life of our, of our persons, brings us to have them as violators of human rights and uh, act actually in the, in the opposite way of what were the... So, so if we relate this with what we are seeing now with the pandemics, John uh, spoke already about the most important ones, but well, actually, we have all this, all this uh, SDGs already uh, related, and we, from our point of interest, peoples, I think it's important to see that the lessons learned have to bring the states to see, or have a look at their development plans uh, from a holistic and transversal and complementary point of view between the different uh, SDGs and not, not to see everything in its, in, its, in its singular aspect because it doesn't bring us uh, as further. So specifically in, the case, in our case with indigenous peoples, it's something really abstruse that in midst of this pandemic where all our people are being put in some sort of black pockets, they 
reminds us uh, the, 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 the age of, of uh, political persecution with these flagrant violations, as uh, Joan said already, in different uh, regions of our country. And all this is something we know about, how much information we have about this, uh, this, uh, this, this rape uh, uh, reports uh, f of indigenous women and, 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 and girls is not uh, being visualized because we don't have access to information. And of course, we not have, don't have to deny the domestic violence to have also in our uh, in our communities. The need that the state see us as subjects and actors, as political actors, political actors, that is something that uh, should be more incorporated in our language because normally they see us more as exotic groups or assistance groups or just they just don't see us at the same level as it would correspond to somebody who wants or should be a, a political subject or, or an actor. So that is why we ask for this right to participate in topics where the state decides in relation, for instance, with, with the concession of extractive industries, exploitation of resources on, in our territories, the right of lands in indigenous territories for the, for the agricultural exploitation. That is a reason for the ex expulsion or expelling of our communities to the suburban regions. And this pandemic has shown us that when we speak about indigenous peoples, we have to incorporate in our language that we are not only we are not only in the uh, in the rural areas that, that poverty in the countryside, expropriation and alienation of of, of land grabbing uh, is something that makes that our population indigenous population has to is being expelled from our communities and expanding the marginal population of the urban area. And this is something very often we have said it, very often we speak about migration, we have to speak also of the, of the, about the question of internal migration and, and, the, and the reasons for it and how it is that with access uh, to education of, of uh, technical education, or these persons uh, finally end up uh, in the suburban uh, marginal areas. I'd like to end saying that in the um, colonized countries, in evangelized countries, we have to eradicate this racist ideology in the exercise of power. We have seen it in the, in the global north, in the south, in, in the global south, with different types of discrimination and uh, exclusion, and just because those who have the power in our countries still have a mentality that is racistic, discriminating, and they think that we don't have the same rights as others have, and so. In order nobody to stay back, in order, in order nobody to, 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 to not to be, to, to be able to follow, we have to liberate us of this mentality that is so uh, rooted in, in, in the mentality of the, of the, of the government, of government uh, class. In order to foster our rights as indigenous persons to choose and to vote, because of course, very often we have the right to vote and we vote uh, for our authorities. Why, what for, and what is one, what do you want our authorities and our political power to decide in the national level or in the different uh, levels of the political level. With this, I want to end. Thank you very much. I don't know if I've uh, exceeded my 10 minutes, but anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Tanquila. Eh, el tema de los... Uh...
de los desafíos que has planteado externos, internos y los desafíos por parte del Estado a los que se enfrentan los pueblos indígenas. El tema de la migración, el tema de los pueblos indígenas en, en zonas urbanas es muy importante y también el, creo que el tema de la, del COVID, la pandemia, lo ha resaltado mucho como uno de los grupos de poblaciones más afectados, uh, uh, los indígenas que viven cerca o en, en, zonas, en zonas urbanas. Y para terminar, por supuesto, el tema de erradicar la, la ideología del racismo, ¿no? que todavía persiste en la mayoría de nuestros países, y la lucha por el derecho a la participación política. Un millón de gracias, Tarcila. Y después de Tarcila quería dar la palabra a Miriam Masakisa, que está reemplazando a Sandra Roy, que por diversas razones lamentablemente no ha podido acompañarnos hoy. Pero Miriam, y paso al inglés, Miriam Masakisa, Quichua, Salasaca, de Ecuador, is currently a United Nations official based in New York and works in the Indigenous Peoples and Development Unit, whose central role is to provide substantive assistance on Indigenous Peoples issues at the UN and support the implementation of the mandate of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Before uh, joining the UN, Miriam was an Indigenous activist, diplomat and advisor to the government of Ecuador with regard to Indigenous issues. Miriam, it is a pleasure to have you with us today and you have the floor for some concluding remarks uh, as uh, the Permanent Forum Secretariat as such and the role of the Permanent Forum Secretariat or what can the Permanent Forum Secretariat and the UN as, an, as a unit of DESA. Uh, what has been your responses with regard to the COVID-19 and indigenous peoples? Thank you, Miriam. Thank you very much, um, Lola. Thank you very much, uh, dear panelists. I am very happy to see you all. Greetings from New York and, of course, uh, from, from Chandra Roy Hendrickson, chief of the, of the branch and also Ms. Anne Nunkan, a chairperson of the Permanent Forum, who fortunately was not able to join us today. And I hope that I can fit their shoes. And, uh, but first of all, I would like to express my solidarity with indigenous peoples around the world who lost families and community members because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think uh, you very well describe what is the situation of indigenous peoples around the world and uh, but uh, certainly I would like to mention that the world is facing the worst public health and economic crisis in a century. As of 20 June 2020 around 463,000 people have died from COVID-19 across the world. The health crisis is affecting all countries including high-income countries in Europe and North America and of course in the region of Latin America. And as you also uh, mentioned already, indigenous peoples are disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic due to the stru structural inequalities and persistent discrimination. And I think um, this is uh, something that it's not new, but uh, certainly came up with this new uh, pandemic. Very uh, important also to mention that indigenous peoples in some of these countries in rural and urban areas are absent from statistics due to lack of disaggregated data. However, news reports have already cited a number of confirmed cases among indigenous peoples with outbreaks reported, for example, from the Navajo Nation of North America, whose infection rate is 10 times than the general population. And all these uh, reports and calls are coming to our office too. Often uh, states are uh, uh, failing by not responding to their specific risks and vulnerabilities paid for indigenous peoples and the absence of accurate data prevents an accurate diagnosis of the negative impact as well as to address adequate responses to the pandemic. 
So, and, and, and then uh, maybe you are asking yourselves, what's the role of the permanent forum? What's the role of, the, of this unit, of this branch uh, within the agenda of 2030? Uh, very quickly, I would like to mention that, um, to remind you and also to maybe uh, in these times of pandemic, feel also proud of the long, long work that the indigenous people's movement um, globally have been made knocking the doors and opening the spaces at the Un United Nations. As you remember, indigenous peoples, as well as the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, took an active role in the consultation and negotiation process that led to the adoption of Agenda 2030. And um, I'm very happy to see also Joanne. Joanne knows very well how these uh, six uh, specific references to indigenous peoples were made possible. It was because of you, because of you at national level, because of you in your communities, and because of you here at the international arena. And um, here, of course, the branch um, has been, uh, since the moment that this pandemic was coming, we were being trying to be prepared. Uh, this was totally new. But uh, from here, the Secretariat, um, it, it has been, of course, uh, following up very closely and uh, prepared uh, two important documents that I can uh, certainly sh share with you in the chat soon. Um, uh, DESA, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, prepared a policy briefing on the impact of COVID-19 and indigenous peoples and listing every single thing that you already mentioned. And of course, calling on states or to take into consideration those, as well as the Interagency Support Group on Indigenous um, uh, People's Issues, prepare a guidance note for the UN system on Indigenous Peoples and COVID-19, which has been, of course, a, a, a task that many focal points from different agencies uh, has been uh, following up uh, what is the situation of indigenous peoples. Hopefully, uh, most of the UN country teams in each uh, country will take into consideration this in order to respond effectively to uh, the situation of indigenous peoples. Also, um, as you know, um, unfortunately, the permanent forum session postponed the annual session. And now uh, uh, for the 2021 session, the members of the forum will be preparing different reports. Uh, one would be related to indigenous people's um, uh, situation um, uh, in reference to COVID, but also would be a very interesting uh, myth, um, report that will analyze the rights of indigenous peoples in the framework of the state of emergency that has been declared at this time and, and the challenges that this implies. So these are some, some of the issues that here uh, in the branch we are trying to, of course, uh, provide support as much as possible to the members of the forum. We have been receiving several notes, guidance notes, considerations that has been prepared by the United Nations Secretary, Secretariat. Uh, and then uh, we have been making sure that the indigenous people's voices has been present there. So we hopefully this can be done. But again, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the power to do much as much as we would like to. As you clearly mentioned, member states need to uh, implement their, um, uh, they need to implement what they, uh, they sign for. Uh, they have several commitments and the UN um, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is one of them. And we hopefully this together with the, uh, with the Agenda 2030 Agenda, would be important that could be uh, used in order to respond. As a, in, in closing, I just wanted to, to mention that um, that also we we will we learn a lot from 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 this um, event and how also indigenous peoples are responding to the threat of COVID nineteen. 
And, uh, but um, even though this is a significant step back for the world's ambition to achieve the SDGs, in particular for poor countries and indigenous peoples, of course, uh, we definitely urge and we encourage states that by, re by restoring economic activities, not simply restore old patterns of environmental degradations. They need to ensure the rights of guardians of the world of the biodiversity. And we are here and, and we will try to do as much as we can. But of course, we will need your support. We will need the support of NGOs like IBGIA uh, and others. And of course, uh, the indigenous peoples around the world to do whatever they need to do. And we are here, we will, I will be sharing with you um, in the chat the links where you can access to this information. And, and that's what I can share uh, at this time. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Miriam. And uh, unfortunately, we are reaching the, the time, the, the limited time that we have, so we won't be able to, to open for questions and answers, but uh, all of you who have put questions in the, in the chat, I encourage the panelists to look at them. And if, uh, if there is some questions, please uh, give it to Ivkia. We will, we will, if you send it to us, we will try to send it to the, to the person who has put that question. Uh, although it's a virtual uh, uh, platform that we can have, but uh, the, the, we have some limitations of time as this is an official event of the High Level Political Forum. So I hope you understand, but I don't want to close the event without thanking, first of all, all the participants who have joined us. I hope you have uh, uh, been able to get some information uh, directly from indigenous peoples and other relevant uh, institutions uh, working um, for the protection and the respect of indigenous peoples' rights. And of course, I want to thank again and uh, for all the panelists for, for sharing with us uh, their experiences on their assessment uh, of the situation now and also envisaging what will happen and what is the role of indigenous peoples and what, how to protect indigenous people's rights in whatever measures comes after the pandemic, and particularly within the framework of the implementation of the SDGs and uh, ensuring and uh, it's an appeal to, to all states uh, to not leave indigenous peoples behind. Again, indigenous peoples has a contribution that can help the whole uh, humankind. So with this uh, urge to states uh, and thanking all the allies, all the institutions that are really working hard uh, and struggling together with indigenous peoples for the promotion of their rights and for a better living for indigenous peoples as any other people in the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>